Hi, I'm Rob Dietz. I'm Michelle Miller. And I'm Jason Bradford. Welcome to Crazy Town, where human waste is our favorite renewable fuel. The topic of today's episode is complexity and specialization. And stay tuned for an interview with Marcin Jakubowski. Hey, Asher, Jason. Don't you guys like it when we have a guest in the studio who can riff with us? Somebody who's actually smarter projects that maybe there's some intelligence to this conversation. And talk about something new. We talk about the same stuff all the time. <laughs> yeah. Can it? Can that person actually just take my place and then I can take a break from this? Uh, our audience is going, yes, yes, please. Yeah, please, all, please. How, how about all three of you just take a break and we'll hear from <laughs> someone decent who actually knows what they're talking about. That would be great. No. Look, the reason I bring it up is it would be nice to have someone else in studio, but if we do that, we're going to have to get a fourth microphone. And I've been having this moral dilemma Mm. about that because, you know, we we talk about consumerism. And so kind of the last thing I want to do is Mm. buy some specialized piece of of electronic equipment from an Amazon store that's sourcing parts out of of China or something like that. So I have a proposal for the two of you. Okay. What's that? Let's make our own microphone. When the three of us do this, not just the two of us? <laughs> the you said two- a proposal for the two of you. Oh, uh, well, I, it would be better if it was the two us of you. Yeah. That's, I, I mean, that's how I interpret yeah, don't it. You, don't I, you, don't you need across. someone to coordinate this process? You could be the manager. Yeah, yeah, okay. I like that. I like that. Okay. Uh, no, okay, I, I'll tell you what. I'll roll up the sleeves, too. Let's yeah. all three of us go out and make a microphone. You think we can do this? From scratch here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, what, what would a final product look like? Uh, I could draw one. It's a microphone made out of dirt. I could grow. <laughs> I could grow. You know, some like fiber crop. And oh, you so like wait. That. Just so I understand, you're saying not just build it with like parts that we're able to order. You mean like actually all the parts yeah. manufacture let's all the parts manufa- too? Let's mine and manufacture everything we need for <laughs> or, or grow it. Like you're saying, Jason, yeah. we can make a hemp microphone. Sure. I, I, I actually have no idea how to do that. I knew how to grow plants, but beyond growing the stuff, <laughs> I just kind of like, I, I let it go from there. Well, I honestly, it would have to be tin cans and string that we just found laying oh. around. Yeah, I mean, we would have to find it, because I'd like to see us try to make a tin can. No, 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 no. <laughs> now, there's a great story, actually. This brings up the story of this uh, guy, Thomas Thwaites. Uh, he's uh, a British, and I don't know, I think about 10 years ago or so, or maybe a little longer than that, he tried to make a toaster from scratch. <laughs> <laughs> wow, toaster. That's- that might yeah. be easier in a microphone. I don't it, know. I, I don't probably know. he he tried to think of something that he thought he could actually do. Yeah. <laughs> and he bought the uh, simplest toaster, the cheapest toaster he could he could buy, and he he disassembled it and it had 400 parts. 400. 400 that parts. Was the simplest, the simplest thing. toaster. <laughs> then he classified the parts by like the materials that were in them, you know, metal, plastic, mica, types of metal, you know, iron base, copper, and and he weighed it all. So he said, "Okay, I need this much copper and this much iron that I make a steel out of somehow. And <laughs> the mica was for insulation. So there's, you know, you can go see YouTube videos. There's a book about it. And it took them a year and cost them tens of thousands of dollars. And it, <laughs> That's the most expensive and, uh, and it blew up as soon as he tried to plug it in. It just started like catching on fire. He needed Robert to like pedal. Remember Robert? On the bicycle? Oh, right. The guy who can generate like a, yeah. a, you know, 500 watts or whatever. Yeah, right, right. right yeah. So it, it was an epic failure, but he kind of thought it was successful. It's well, sort of one of these like success failure. So, sounds like he should have set out to make a landmine instead of a toaster. He would have been totally successful. Right. <laughs> yeah, but it, yeah, it gets to the. He, he apparently had to find some like 15th or 16th century metallurgy book because metallurgy is so complex and industrialized now that he had to figure out well, how did they do it in the olden days. Well, that's what I was saying. Like they poison their rivers. That's totally he true. had to get copper. He's like out there with a pickaxe. Yes, and then he, what? So you got some broken rock. How are you going to make copper wire out well, of that? Well, he had to figure it out. So he went to professors at the local universities and historians, and it's not easy. So that's, that's I think, the, uh, an important hidden driver, really, is, is how complex the world is nowadays and how specialized you have to be to understand how to do anything, right? Like I have, I can grow food and that's a specialty, but I wouldn't know how to take that, (laughs) that hemp fiber and turn it into a microphone. So you're saying that 
the level of complexity involved in making stuff in the world today is a hidden driver that's led us into crazy times. Yes, because what ends up happening is it, it sort of, you get locked into this complexity. Once, once you're part of this, once this thing that's, that's rolling, it, there's, a, there's an evolution that happens where complexity begets complexity. It's like a biblical character. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and what ends up happening is you end up having to manage all, all the complexity. So for this toaster to happen, obviously there are mines in one part of the world and a smelter in another for one set of products. And then there's probably like the plastics are happening over here, you know, based upon some natural gas production that gets piped to the plant, Good. which then gets turned into pellets, which then gets reformulated into something else, which gets put in some injection molding, which then gets shipped and you, uh, assembled, and then it gets sold. And you, you lost me at smelter. I don't even know what that is. <laughs> All right. Wait. <laughs> so before we get into that, I think, I, think, I think you're right. I think this is an important topic. And something that maybe we don't tend to think that much about. We just assume that this is a normal state of affairs. Maybe it's useful to just step back and think about where all this complexity and specialization came from in the first place, right? Because it's not like, yes, we have a modern form of this, right? right? But I think that societies, you know, there is this idea, this concept of complex societies that we've talked about before. Yeah. I mean, look at the original toaster and the Flintstones. It was right. not the same as the ones we have today. <laughs> no, the, but it was pretty complex. The Flintstone toy, is that just a rock? <laughs> what is that? <laughs> yeah, they heat a rock up and they a stick pterodactyl a pterodactyl pe- farts in a slot <laughs> or something. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So, like, where did this come from? I mean, wouldn't you say that it's, it all comes back to when we decided to domesticate plants and animals and we became agrarian societies and sedentary and started living in cities and shit yeah i think that that's what allows that to set that evolutionary you know treadmill we get on I, it allows it to get started i believe yes yeah that's like i think going back in economic history that's the whole idea an agricultural surplus frees up all this labor to right. do all the other it's tasks the sur- out there. it's a surplus thing so again it comes back to energy we had more energy at our disposal right mm-hmm. uh in terms of you know, caloric energy than we had to expend. We didn't have to have quite as many people involved in growing food. We weren't just hunting and gathering stuff, which pretty much everyone was involved in for the yeah. most part. And so that created cities it, and that created sort of complex elements of society where you had specialization of priests and every once in a while, you know, a, a very small number of people got to be kings and queens and what have you. Different layers and hierarchies within society, managers right? of microphone builders. Yes, that was managers. A, uh, yeah, microphones weren't quite. Well, there I, yet. I think about so like in sports, we recognize or music, we recognize easily the expertise of someone. Okay, we like we look, we can see somebody play a guitar, or we can see someone like do a pole vault or an incredible serve, and we go, "Wow, the the incredible years of training that they've had, like the ability they had." not to grow potatoes they've had time to do this other stuff and they've it's, had this, uh, malcolm gladwell's ten thousand hours right yeah so to have those ten thousand hours have needs. those ten thousand yeah. I mean, some but somehow you've gotten your other needs met right someone else is meeting them yeah. yeah but i think it's true it's not just in these sports and these things that are visible to us it is the people that are involved in the in the sciences and the industrial arts who are you know making the metallurgist or whatever, or the food scientist. Yeah, or- I mean, it's hard to put in the time to get a PhD in chemical engineering if you have to be yeah. mounding up your potatoes. I guess my point is, even before we had the level of complexity and specialization we had now, we have now, <laughs> there was complexity in society. Yeah. So we've we've been doing this for for a while and got more probably more and more complex over time well yeah right? according to jason that complexity begat more complexity <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. i got to say begat i've been wanting to, <laughs> been wanting to say that for a while yes like you could think of like the rise of the mercantile class and trade and spices and well then what do you need you need all the ships and navigation expertise and language expertise and you need the pirates to raid those ships right. that's a that's a whole nother job <laughs> class complexity I, maybe. the arg class <laughs> yeah you, you, you need parrot tenders <laughs> parrot tenders <laughs> yeah, eye patch makers <laughs> right you know? uh, skull and crossbone weaver weavers <laughs> yes. uh, but you know fossil fuels obviously did put this all on hyperdrive right i mean what we have now with the, the level of complexity and specialization we 
that we see in the modern world now. All that stuff that we were just talking about on hyperdrive. Yeah, when you you talked about the caloric surplus from, say, growing wheat or corn or something like that, but the the caloric surplus from digging up fossil fuels uh, that was exponential growth. I mean, we, we right. it freed us up to do. I mean, it, even talking about uh, the farm situation, labor on the farm has been steadily dropping until now. It's what less than three percent of of the economy. And I think it was it was probably like this sort of reinforcing dynamic where you had more more people, not everybody, obviously, but you have more people with available time that provides more opportunity for education for some, right? Yes. You have people who are then able to spend their free time and their education to think about new inventions, ways of innovating things, uh, understanding the natural world, which leads to new products, new technology, new, new ways of, of using Harnessing yeah. not only free human time, but also, you know, the capacity of, of these resources, right? Right. Which well, creates more complexity. Well, and thinking about another way that complexity begat more complexity, if you have fossil fuels that enable the, the levels of transportation that we have, that lets you create these hubs, cities, uh, hubs, universities, hub like Silicon Valley, where you can just locate all of these specialists who are then combining to make, uh, you know, whatever, all the wonders of the world. Right. While they don't have to worry about the food situation because that's just all being trucked into them. Yeah. No, that's really true. And, and I, I, had this, I had this hypothesis when I was thinking about this situation. I said, well, let's back up for a second. You guys ever had to fill out like this form for the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics that codifies the job you're in or or the job code for someone who's working for you? That sounds like something a responsible person no, has I, to do. I, I, I haven't done much of that. I don't I'm think afraid. the Bureau of Labor Statistics cared what I was doing. They didn't want to hear from me. They actually You're sh- worthless. They actually shunned you. <laughs> exactly. They didn't, didn't want your answer. What, what are you talking about here? Well, so, you know, you think of like, like economists say, well, there's so many jobs in this sector or that sector. Or there's, there's job growth in this sector, but there's okay. job loss in that sector. Or this part of the country has more jobs in this sector. Where do they come up with that? Well, they're keeping track of everybody's job. So everyone who's employed is coded. Okay. And it's standardized. Okay. So the US has their own standard. Talk about specialization. So there's somebody who made that shit up in the first place. Yes. Right? And those, that's that's their person, job. that person is classified as well. <laughs> yes. So, so they're at the top. Right? <laughs> they're, they put themselves the, at the ruler top. of very all. Tall. <laughs> exactly. So, so I looked into the first, I, I, my hypothesis was this. It was that you can divide, kind of like ecosystems, right? We talked about there's the primary kind of level of the ecosystem, which would be like plant life, right? And then there's, there's stuff that eats plants. So you can think of this in the economy. They're sort of the primary productive sectors of the economy, like growing food, having, having wood products, let's say forestry, or having energy products, so mining for oil and gas or mining minerals. Mm-hmm. Those are getting the raw material inputs. and delivering them then to what would be called the secondary le- level of the con. Those are the folks that take those raw inputs and get them into forms that we start to recognize and be able to then use. So manufacturing and value-added processing. Everything else above that's tertiary. So sales and managerial classes and professional classes. So my hypothesis was that our society is so advanced through this, to this you know, complexity, kind of complexity on complexity, that we would have this bloated tertiary class, and we would have this sort of tiny little primary or primary sector class. So I, I, I decided first I'd look for the U.S. Okay, I'd say, what's, what's the U.S. like? The problem was there was somewhere between eight and 900 job classifications in the U.S., <laughs> and I can only pay attention for about half an hour. I only wanted to do this for right, about half an hour. Right, right. And I'm like, I'm not going to run through these in a half so I, I went to this international standard and found 137 jobs. Oh, that's better. More yeah. manageable. More yeah. manageable. And I did that. I broke them up. And they're, they're awesome. Can I just jump in here and say yeah. that your hypothesis needs a name? I think it's the Lloyd Dobler hypothesis. Oh. You, you know who that is? No. I don't so, know. <laughs> Lloyd Dobler was the main character in a, in a of course, a, a late 80s movie. Called, shocker. Called this is a shocker. Yeah. <laughs> it's called Say Anything. Right? Oh, yeah. And uh, it, it was a good movie. It was really formative for me. But I, I remember this quote from it that, uh, that I got to read to you now. Okay. okay? 
Lloyd uh, was, I'll set it up. He's at a dinner at his girlfriend's house, his, his, the girl that he's hoping will be his girlfriend. And her dad is there with a bunch of his business associates. And they're kind of like, so Lloyd, what are you, what are you going to do after you graduate high school? And he's like, <laughs> uh, and so he, he launches yeah. into this answer. He says, okay. I don't want to sell anything, buy anything, or process anything as a career. I don't want to sell anything bought or processed, or buy anything sold or processed, or process anything sold, bought, or processed, or repair anything sold, bought, or processed. <laughs> hey, come to the farm, buddy. That's a guy that wants to be in the primary sector. I Yeah, I think if if he were, that's why it's the Lloyd Dobler hypothesis. He's <laughs> He's anti-secondary and tertiary sure. levels. <laughs> right, right. Excellent. Thank you. Lloyd yeah. Dobler. Okay, okay I so you had this hi- hypothesis, had hypothesis named of, after Lloyd. Not Lloyd Dobler. Hypo- <laughs> and? Yeah. So I go to the, I find the International Standard Classification of Occupations on Wikipedia. <laughs> and, uh, and it has 137 jobs. They're in 10 major groups. And they're divided into these groups. Managers, professional, technicians. Clerical support workers, service and sales, skilled agriculture, forestry, fishery, craft related trades, plant and machine operators and assemblers, elementary occupations, and armed forces. So, where do the pirates go? Are they in the armed forces? <laughs> We're podcasters. Yeah. Where am I on this? Yeah. Well, you go through and find it. That's a know? major group of its own, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. I, I'm that afraid we'll never find ourselves in this classification. We're just, we're just banned from it. But what's, what's amazing is that yeah, if you scroll through this and you count, you say, okay, which, how many jobs go into each one, right? Each of these. Essentially, what we've come to is that there are 89 of the 131 jobs. 130. Is it 130 or? 137, you said. Shit, I could be wrong. 131 jobs. Mm. <laughs> 89 are in tertiary. 31 are in secondary. There's only 11 freaking jobs in the world left <laughs> that are primary. You mean all this stuff that we actually really rely on? Yeah. You know? There's yeah. actually the only 11, 11 people <laughs> doing those jobs. And that's because we've been able to take all this energy in these machines right. and say, uh, yeah, let's, let's just put a person on a tractor. Yeah. And, and so, yes, basically now we've inverted this pyramid. Where usually the pyramid is like the base is the biggest our base is now this little point. Yeah. And it's teetering now because we've got this heavy weight of all these tertiaries and this poor little base of primary trying to support it all. Yeah. A few years back, uh, Kurt Cobb, you guys know him, right? He's oh, yeah. An energy great. analyst, writer. He, uh, he often publishes stuff on our resilience.org website. He actually put this figure together. We'll, we'll put it in the notes, but he's, he's got exactly what you're talking about, where he's got Basically, industries and agriculture and forestry is at the bottom, this tiny little wedge. And as you go up, he's, he's putting stuff like construction and retail trade, and they're bigger and bigger chunks of the economy. And on the top is FIRE, which okay. stands for uh, finance, insurance, real estate, and, and, and it's the biggest chunk. Right. It's like over 20% of the economy. But That's the amount of money going Yeah, I think we need sector. to distinguish between yeah. the number of people and the proportion of the economy, yeah. right? And so it feels like there are a few different things here. There's only 11 types of jobs in the primary, right? right. But that's not necessarily a reflection of how many people. In, in the case of the U.S., I would imagine is actually not that many people. Right. In the global context, there's probably still a significant number of people that are involved in primary, depending upon where you right. are in the world, right? Right. It's less and less every year now, but yes. Right, but the key thing in the United States in particular, is that there are not very many people, for example, involved in, in growing food. But it's also, you think about it from the standpoint, of who gets paid, right? Right. Yes. It's not only are there so many people, so many more different roles and jobs in the tertiary, right? they get paid the big bucks, right? Because yeah. they're mostly just paying each other, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. They're like, yo, you're like me, you must be worth a lot of money. Well, they're decision makers. They get to decide where capital flows, probably, right? I, I think that's true. And I also think that this is part of the insight that comes from looking at, at what happens when societies get too complex, okay? Is that this is, you guys familiar with Joseph Tainer? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. He wrote this famous book in 1988, Collapse of Complex Societies. And so this becomes the problem. You're pointing out the problem in that 
it's not just that the tertiary gets paid a lot more. It's not just that there's more jobs there. It's that when you have a society that, it, that, is, that has moved so far that direction, it actually is a cost. So this complexity has a cost to it in that managing, managing all, these, all this complexity becomes a chore in and of itself. And it gets more and more difficult to manage it as, the, as there's like, it's like, you know, taking that toaster apart, there's 400 parts of it. Right. That's just one little piece of the, <laughs> that's one little consumer product. And so we have the, the, these, these tertiary sector folks are doing absolutely key things, many of them, <laughs> except for bolts and bullshit jobs out there, <laughs> but they're doing absolutely key things that hold the entire civilization together. You know, like, like the electric grid, for God's sakes, like there's some yeah. damn important specialists out there. I would have no ability to step in and take over any of those person's yeah. jobs. Most of them worked at Enron. <laughs> <laughs> but the isn't Tainer's thesis then that if you have all this complexity and you start running into these problems like you're talking about, your your society tends to go more complex to try to solve them. So you got to like have a toaster consultancy industry that, that builds up to <laughs> well, take care of your toaster problem. Or like there's a pollution that comes as a result of the smelting. You're smelting more ore. I use that word for you again. Okay. Okay. I thought a smelt was a kind of fish. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Are they involved in the process? <laughs> Are we outsourcing our uh, metallurgy to a school of fish? You, over, you overfish smelt, and then you have to have manage the fishery. So you have fisheries managers. Anyway, so what you're what I'm adding, saying is that yes, it's it's what we do causes problems as we grow, especially this is a problem of growth, and we we use complexity to solve problems of kind of growth and and complexity itself, and so it ends up then just becoming overburdensome managerially. Well, right. So I feel like you're pointing out the the snake chasing its own tail dynamic in in a sense of complexity the more complex we get the more we need specialists yes right figure it out and and the system com- becomes so complex that like no no single person can can manage it or figure it out yeah. or, or anything Do you even understand um, your taxes and there's a lot of vulnerability yeah right within within that system especially when we've created a situation where you have these like global supply chains and other things that are so complex where there's this specialization of different elements within a supply chain and if any single one of them breaks down the whole system doesn't operate anymore but can we just name some of the other challenges here we're running and we've talked about this on this podcast we're running up against limits to our ability to continue to grow and consume and you know harvest nature without massive implications whether it's depleting these non-renewable resources or it's climate change and other forms of pollution that there's a reckoning with those, right? And I think that when we're trying to deal with those issues, we're extremely fucked. <laughs> we're not just fucked, guys. We are extremely <laughs> fucked. Okay? Trying not to picture what that uh, what that entails, but so uh, <laughs> no, I'm I'm serious. Think about this. We we can't keep doing what we're doing, right? For many many reasons, right? And we don't know how to how to sort of like simplify it or pull it back. Because we're all specialists, or so yes. many of us are specialists, and and the people that are responsible, one, we don't have generalists. We don't have people who are like, right. hey, have you thought about this thing and this thing and this thing? Holy shit. If you think about them together, we might have a problem here, right? So right. we don't have people that are in a situation where they're sort of pulled out far enough to be able to see the overall picture to say, we might have a problem here. Right. But also the people that are all these tertiary people or whatever you want to call them who are highly rewarded for being specialists, right? I got a master's degree in business or whatever the fuck it is. That's, that's, um, there's nothing to that anymore though. But I, I, I'm just saying that <laughs> I know what you mean. There, the mentality is yeah. to double down partly because it's a, it's a justification for their, <laughs> for their role. Right? right. So how do we, how do no, we I, untangle that? Well, I first, think you're right. First we got to make, that into an insult you tertiary son of a <laughs> bitch <laughs> but but no i think that's a good point is you are rewarded for becoming more and more specialized in our society you know imagine uh you know whatever if you become a rocket scientist or a brain surgeon or whatever stereotypical 
uh, version of a highly specialized job. It's you're held in so much higher esteem than, uh, yeah, somebody who's who's just uh, whatever Jason running a farm. <laughs> yeah, some some simpleton who. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, the other thing that we've done is, you're right. Not only you're more highly rewarded. I think for many people, getting an education feels like you must specialize right. in order to justify the cost of that education. Yeah. Right? So you're just completely locked in. It doesn't. It's actually not rational to become a generalist or to focus working at that primary level or maybe even right. secondary level because it's not even being rewarded or having status or yeah. being able to go to some far off place. It's on like vacation. it's like uh, trying to sell yourself in the professional sports market and you say. You know, I'm pretty good at ping pong, and I'm a damn, I'm, I'm a really decent tight end, and I can swim a pretty fast 400 meter freestyle. Right. It's like Jim <laughs> Thorpe back in, uh, back in the old days. Yeah, yeah. He, he could yeah. do all those things. And I like high jumping. I'm not great. I like it, though. It's fun. I'm working on this. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, you're right. It's, it's, and so I think you have this whole, you have this Holden mentality, right? Where, and, and also you feel like you have, if you're highly specialized, you have actually a sense of competency in what you're doing. And you were like, well, I know what I'm doing. I got this. So I'm going to expect that all the other specialists right. out there have got everything else handled. But really, the problem becomes more at, at, these, at these things that you don't see. You've got blinders on. It's the weight of the entire system and the fact that the energetic and material basis for propping it all up and we up, all just assume somebody else has got that figured out, right? And no it's not one, our specialty. It must be someone it else's. It must be someone uh -huh. else's, right. right. So, okay, so if we're painting ourselves into this corner, right. you're saying complexity, one, has this problem of getting more complexity, and eventually the inverted pyramid will fall over. Yes. And we're also saying that you're rewarded for specializing within the kind of economy we've developed. So is there any time that anybody's once gotten out of that corner? Once. Joseph? You mean historically yeah. or yeah, as, yeah. As historically yeah. or just some some examples okay, that we can I, look at. I know I I I'm trying to throw some happy thought out there to and, and so Joseph Tainer again, the guy that, you know, brought up the collapse of complex societies in nineteen eighty eight. I, I found another paper by him in two thousand in which I've got this quote from The Byzantine Empire responded with one of history's only examples of a complex society simplifying. Much of the structure of ranks and honors based on urban life disappeared. Civil administration simplified and merged in the countryside with the military. Governmental transaction costs were reduced. The economy contracted and there were fewer artisans and merchants. Elite social life focused on the capital and the emperor rather than on the cities that no longer existed. So, yeah. So that's an example of a, of a society that, that simplified in order not to collapse. In order, they, well, I think Tainter would call this a sort of a managed collapse. Mm -hmm. Like there's, there's a collapse a with a big C sense. and there's a collapse with a little C. I, so I guess it's a question of control. It's control. Level. So it, I it think prevents, a, a progressive European economist would call it degrowth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how many, this is a great question, how many people who are promoting that realize how much simplica simplification needs to happen of the social structure and this pyramid we're talking about, and the tertiary has to shrivel, the primary has to expand. Do they understand that is what I wonder. Yeah. I, I, I would expect that some do, and some probably are too specialized and focus on some aspect of it. So yeah. I guess the next question is for us to try to figure out, well, what do we actually do with this information? Where do we go with it? Because even if we want to pull out of the complexity and civilization, specialization cycle, it's hard to do so. You know, a lot of the things we would want to do are not rewarded. It's like, apply more labor instead of mechanization for work. Become a generalist. <laughs> <laughs> and then you, you can't, live yourself. So enroll others in this grand task <laughs> of becoming a more labor-intensive generalist society. Tough ask. <laughs> well, we're all about the tough ask here in crazy town. I mean, uh, why, why wouldn't we be? If, if we're like what you said earlier, Asher, about this 
complexification, if that's a word, that's a complex word. But this complexification is leading to these problems that, what did you say? We're not just fucked, we're what? We're really fucked. I, th- I think you actually stepped it up further. You said extremely, extremely fun, which, yeah, extremely which might be a new sport. Uh, <laughs> but like, if we're if we're getting to that, then yeah, why can't we ask people some some tough questions or, I, or propose something difficult? Yeah, I think it, talk about being a crazy town because as our complex systems are are shuddering or uh, are manifesting their fragility. We need the people. Right? We're, you're talking about electricity, right? The yeah. grid, for example. If we're starting to have issues with the grid, which we've re- recently seen, we do need those specialized people to be able to fix that or else people freeze, right? Yeah. So it's understandable while we're in this system that is complex that we need specialized people to help figure out the problems, but then we're just doubling down. It's right. like we have to simultaneously operate. Yes, the simpler simpler way, as Ted Trainer said. <laughs> well, and maybe it's a matter of, I don't know the history well enough to say, but I like the idea of, if you want to think of it as the Byzantine model, if we said, okay, we can't get from A to B overnight. Getting from A to B overnight is basically a shit show. Yes. Because it's a it's a Seneca cliff collapse, yes, right? Yes, the Roman model. So <laughs> if we want to get from A to B in a gradual way, which is now we have a, si- a system that's hugely complex with way too many people in this tertiary level, and we need to get to a place where it's much more simplified and people much more engaged in primary activities. How do we get from here to there? That means X percent of our focus and money and time needs to be continue to be on managing the complexity we have while we're investing and maybe it's it's childhood investment, well, you know, childhood education, investment in generalized thinking, well, various skills building, that kind of thing. We'll we'll get to some ideas here in a minute in our do the opposite segment, but uh, I think you can at least start by deciding you're not going to process anything, <laughs> buy anything sold, bought or processed, or repair any bought, sold, processed stuff. It, and as we just pointed out, if that were the case, we would be starving. <laughs> Stay tuned for our George Costanza Memorial Do the Opposite segment, where we discuss things we can do to get the hell out of crazy town. Now you don't have to just listen to the three of us blather on anymore. We've actually invited someone intelligent on the program to provide inspiration. Hey guys, here's a five-star review on iTunes that we got recently. Uh, I'm assuming that's graded on a 10-point scale I or think something so. like that, maybe a 30-point. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is from 9 Blue one Great names uh, from our reviewers. Nine Blue One says, This is just a fantastic, well produced podcast that allows you to laugh off the darkest, most difficult subjects imaginable. It turns out that at least three of the horsemen are also stand up comics. Just subscribe, put this in your weekly mix. You'll end up smarter, better prepared, and surprisingly, more sane. You'll see. So, uh, I, I like that we're the horsemen. <laughs> Yeah. It's kind of embarrassing, embarrassingly nice. I, I know. I know. I, I'm kind of, I'm blushing. God. Yeah. I, yeah. I, my immediate thought was they must be listening to a different podcast. Well, except that uh, as a horseman, you spread death. That's, that's, uh, that, that's, that's embedded in this really nice positive review. That doesn't make me feel better. Okay. I, I have cowboy boots. What does that have to do with anything? Horse riding. Oh, oh. okay. Yeah. yeah. So, hey, if you like the podcast, you should leave us a review as well. You need to be at least as gushing as that review was, or else don't bother. Yes. Every decision I've ever made in my entire life has been wrong. (laughs) My life is the complete opposite of everything I want it to be. If every instinct you have is wrong, then the opposite would have to be right. (laughs) Okay, so you guys know I'm a farmer, and... That's that would be classified as the primary sector, obviously. <laughs> I feel kind of, feel kind of good. About, you think you're special, but uh, kind of good the rest of the world thinks you're a PM. Yeah. <laughs> How about writer, podcaster, non profiteer? Okay, uh, that yeah. puts me in the uh, yeah. quintenary. Isn't sector farmer or non profiteer the same thing? <laughs> right, right. right. Well, you know, what's interesting though is when you when you kind of delve into the details of what somebody has to do, it's it's it actually gets really interesting, I think. And there's some there's some stuff to to tease out here because. I've actually gone from working 
for for a, a you know mid sized business that had eighty employees or so, and I was a manager there. It was a farming company, but we had all these specialists that did you like tertiary <laughs> son of a bitch. <laughs> right, right. So here we are producing food. It's primary, but my role in it was was very tertiary. Like I wasn't driving tractors or whatever. And now I've moved though to my own small business, you know, where I kind of have to do almost everything. I have to run the equipment, plant the seeds. I I do the accounting, right? I do yeah. sales. So it's very interesting though to think about how much more of a generalist I am doing the same kind of job in the same sector. Yeah. You would say, uh, at least I think you would say, that that prepares you better for the world that's coming yeah, than maybe. where you were before. It also is an interesting example of how management complexity is a real thing. Because I remember a lot of what we had to do in the company was set up meetings all the time. Got to talk to, <laughs> we got to call the office in California, and I got to travel there. And, and you know, you're, you're, you get this scheduling, and you're, you're calling on phone, and you're meeting in the office. And now it's like the meetings are in my head. Okay, okay. The the sales. You're and talking the account- yourself. Yeah, the right. sales department, the accounting department, and the the operations logistic is well, all in my head. It's interesting because we were talking about you know, complexity and specialization and and simplify. Yeah, you know, we're talking about simplifying, right? right? Right. But actually, what you're doing here by going from a tertiary specialist, you know, elite fufu guy <laughs> to a farmer, right? It's it's quite complex what you're what you're doing. I mean, you're right. juggling a lot of things. You're you're playing a lot of roles. Yeah. So at the individual level, in some ways, it's actually more more complex. There's more diversity of roles I have. But I think if there were more people farming and less people at the tertiary level, the society in general right. would be more simple. It's just an interesting paradox. It's, yeah, it's a paradox. It's, you could say society is more simplified, but but people's or jobs so- are actually more complex on some level. Well, I don't know if it's more challenging. I'd like to think it's probably more rewarding, or at least even intellectually more I stimulating. love it, because I get to shift tasks all the time. I feel like doing this, and now I don't. So, well, there's always something else I should be doing. But, but I, and I just step into a different role. I'm on a spreadsheet now, or I'm walking a field. I mean, very different. I was racking my brain for an 80s movie to name this paradox, you know, like... Uh, <laughs> uh, and I came up with the regarding Henry paradox. That was a Harrison Ford movie where... Uh, he's like some kind of financier, lawyer, or some, and he's a real jerk. But then he he gets shot, and he becomes an awesome person. So, <laughs> <laughs> is that what happened to Jason? Yeah, something happened. Somebody where, shot Jason. Where he was a cog in the machine, and now now he's got a now he's got a primary job. Uh, is this your do the opposite? <laughs> uh, time out. <laughs> <laughs> hey, no, not time for the disclaimer. No, actually, Crazy Town does not. <laughs> I, I actually have a real uh, do the opposite. Uh, have you guys ever read this book that came out recently called Range? Why Generalists Tr- Triumph in a Specialized World? Ooh, sounds like the kind of thing I should read. Yeah, it's uh, by the, uh, an author, David Epstein. And uh, really what he's saying is that there are uh, people out there who are doing better because they didn't specialize. Mm-hmm. And he, he kind of goes through some examples. His lead in, he's talking about, uh, you would appreciate this, Jason, uh, your uh, tennis background, talking about Roger Federer and how mm-hmm. he wasn't holding a racket in his hand from, uh, you know, from age one. He was doing all these other different sports and kind of just becoming a really good athlete before he, he specialized in tennis. Nice. That's good. No, I didn't know that. Right. That. That's in contrast to like, Tiger Woods, right? right. Who, who, he was golfing in the womb. Yeah. His, <laughs> his forearm was actually a putter. It was a weird uh, mutation. His mom must so. have really appreciated all that. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, let's move along from that. <laughs> <laughs> Moving right along. <laughs> well, I think that, you know, what we have then is this paradox, right? And it does, it does behoove us to, I think, figure out ways to think through it. And I, I do think that while it's hard to be a generalist, it's also in many ways rewarding because you've got this diversity of skills. There's also, you know, so right now you can think about this society, this globalized civilization that's trying to suck resources and inject commerce everywhere. But there may be pockets left of people who are living in ways that are more, you know, simple. 
and they may they may survive the crash of industrial civilization if we leave them alone for a while longer and they don't get sucked into this protect machine. them from those commerce injections <laughs> yeah. that are coming their way yeah so gosh yeah uh, i think that's really important you know there's probably remote amazonian regions or high mountain regions there are people living hunter gatherer or, or, or small scale agrarian peasant lives leave them let them do it. And still the majority of farmers, people who are doing the most primary of primary yeah. roles in the world are still smaller scale, yeah. right, in the world, even though we have huge industrial agriculture and consolidation of power within the agricultural system, particularly in places like the United States. Yeah, there's in-between still we want to bring yeah, up too, and, right, yeah. right. And, yeah, there's people that are maybe tied into commerce and maybe they use some industrial equipment, but at least they're small and they... They have a great deal of skills, and they may be able to more easily step back into the more localized, more autonomous role. Right. But on this idea that you're talking about protecting indigenous cultures and places where people have been able to resist the, the colonization and, and, and commercialization aspects of, of our culture, I feel somewhat hopeful that there's more awareness in the general public. And uh, the reason I think that is some of the books that have kind of hit bestseller lists, you see um, the book Sand Talk by Tyson Yunkaporta that's about, mm -hmm. uh, I think the subtitle is How Indigenous Thinking Can Save the World. And mm -hmm. Robin Wall Kimmerer had Braiding Sweetgrass, which is about indigenous culture and different ways to, to see the world. And those are catching on amongst the general populace, because I think they're one way or another sensing this over-complexification. Yeah, I think you're right. So there is that. And then there's also, well, what do you do if you're one of the people <laughs> that has been trapped in this? How do you, is there a way to pull out? But besides getting shot. Besides right? <laughs> getting shot. Well, I, I think that if you can figure out a way, it's not going to be easy. Everyone's got their own you know, personal story. But Try to simplify in your life a little bit. Try to simplify in your community. Be less reliant on, on complex global civilization. And that may be simple things like being good at some craft. Or you, can, you learn how to make stuff. You learn how to reskill. Learn how to grow food. And then teach others and be involved in groups that are doing these kind of things. I, I, I just want to split those for a second. Because okay. I think that they're, they're both really important and deserve their own attention. So one of them is participating less in the globalized, complex society that we have, which, by the way, that is the single biggest driver of the communities and the places in the world that we talked about, just talked about protecting. Uh -huh. That's putting those under threat. Yeah. So if we want to actually try to assist in the preservation of right. a more traditional communities and knowledge and participate less yeah. In this extractive globalized economy. So think about your purchasing. Think about what you're consuming and yeah, all that. Yeah, build your own microphone. But, right. right. <laughs> but then kind of related but separate to that is build more skills yourself. Right. Right. So and maybe you can line those things up so that the skills that you're building are ones that you're building in order to replace your participation in this globalized economic system. Yeah. But just even the task of learning a new skill, it could even be learning how to play an instrument. Yeah. Just pushing ourselves to, to try new things, to, to adapt new behaviors, use different parts of our brains, what have you. And if you want to really go down the track of sort of understanding these sort of really key processes that led to more advanced civilization, there is an interesting book, and there's a whole group of people who are interested in doing this because they're worried about existential threats. They're worried about civilization falling and us going into a new dark age. And so there's a book called The Knowledge, How to Rebuild Our World from Scratch by uh, Lewis Dartnell. And so one of the things you could do is sort of follow along that track where you say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to like curate <laughs> something really important. Like, I know how to make glass. There are actually people working on this stuff. To capture this knowledge. Yeah, to capture this I, knowledge, practice it, and hold it locally even. I just wait mm -hmm. on the beach for a lightning storm to come over, and when lightning hits the sand, glass. <laughs> All right, well... Sounds <laughs> spoken like a true tertiary <laughs> jerk. You're going you're gonna to wrap that up That's in some a, kind of marketing product and sell it? You just came up with the insult. It's tur jerk. <laughs> tur -jerk. <laughs> All right. I'm a tur jerk.
All right, I'd like to introduce a guest for our show. This is Marcin Jakubowski. He is the founder and executive director of Open Source Ecology, a collaborative of engineers, producers, and builders, and they're developing the Global Village Construction Set, which is a set of 50 most important machines that it takes for modern life to exist, everything from a tractor to an oven to a circuit maker. And Marcin and his team are producing open source blueprints so that anyone can build and maintain machines at a fraction of what it costs a day. And I find his life story kind of interesting. He graduated with honors from Princeton University and earned his doctorate in fusion physics from the University of Wisconsin. But after receiving his formal education, he found himself useless in solving the wicked problems of the world and started a farm in rural Missouri, which is now called the Factor E Farm, where this global village construction set is being developed and tested. Hi, Martin. Really happy to, to meet you. And this Crazy Town episode, like we talk about, is about complexity and its cousin specialization, like job specialization. And we kind of, we kind of discuss how societies have evolved to become more complex over time. And there's a lot more knowledge in the world, a lot more people that do things that you can't imagine doing yourself because they're, they're just, they're specialists. Oh, yeah. And this leads to the situation, I think I find myself where I don't understand how the world works. And it's just mm. sort of this big organism, right? That's moving along. So anyway, um, I find it fascinating to watch what you're doing because you're, ch- you're trying to sort of break industrial civilization down into these component machines, you know, the 50 things you need. Yeah. Whereas I look at industrial civilization and I see that it's just part of maybe this, this what's happened in all these societies where they become fragile as they become more complex mm, yeah. and end up, you know, historically not, not persisting. So I wanted to talk to you in this sort of do the opposite segment of the show because we want to get into what individuals or societies might do to be the opposite of what it's done in the past, which is ever more complex trade networks, ever more complex yeah. and sort of incomprehensible technologies and urbanization. And I know you, you live on a farm mm. like I do. So can you talk to us about your life's path and your work and how that sort of fits into this do the opposite in the context of social complexity and specialization? So I got up to far flung degrees up to a PhD in physics. And the, the notion there was solutions for simple pressing world issues. I come from Poland. My grandparents were in a Polish underground World War II concentration camps uh, coming to America in 1982. But I saw this stark difference between here's one country that is deprived and here's another country that's prosperous. And what's the difference? The difference in operating system. It's a difference in, in the governance structures and everything else because everyone has the same resources. We all have Rocks, sunlight, plants, soil, water. That's where all the wealth comes from. Hmm. So let's talk about education to get us as capable humans trying to make a better world for everybody. I got very disappointed the farther I went in my education because I was feeling more and more useless. And that's hmm. that's why I started this project to actually try to make a difference. And I want to go right directly to the co- connection of that to open source and open collaboration which is what we're about. Our mission is collaborative design for a transparent and inclusive economy of abundance. So we live in a world that's pretty complex, but a lot of that has to deal with that kind of transparency and open sourceness of the world where in many ways we confuse things, obfuscate things by design. It's part of the hidden structural evils we have here. Things like patenting and and then... Making things yeah. like maybe even they're going to break after a while, so you buy another, or you know, yeah. it's really hard to repair. Yes, those are manifestations of this phenomenon on a product level, and mm-hmm. products are economies. So we live in a completely proprietary economy, and when you think about uh, the state of art in human learning, there's no such thing because because everything is proprietary. You always get to learn the next to best stuff. Hmm. Nobody shares the best information. Someone's got the best thing, they patent it. It's a, yeah. it's a really profound issue in society that we don't really see it. We think we're innovating, Google, Amazon, and all this stuff. We are right. in a stone age of innovation, and we're causing more problems right now than we're solving. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, that's very interesting. Yeah, so that's, I mean, I think that's the status of things. We have to be honest to recognize it, but most people don't recognize that co-op, cooperation, collaboration does not exist. Mm-hmm. And you can get into collaboration, what is it? And, and Yeah, so that's a complete opposite of the idea that private self-interest and greed will motivate people and teams of people to innovate and, and solve problems. And you're saying, well... Kind of, but also it also says it's also part of the system that then says, well, I have to keep it to myself. I can't share it openly. And and I, you know what makes me think of the pandemic, right? Why wasn't there a complete open source on the vaccines, you know? And did you hear the one from Sweden or some Nordic country? They had it months ago. They had an open version. And then mm-hmm. the government went with the proprietary version because that's the way funding works. You can... Uh. Uh, basically, the interests went towards the big industrial interests of pharmaceutical companies as opposed to healing that essentially for free, like less yeah. profit. And this is one of those things that are just like right now in, a, in the current world, it's, it's abominable how that happens. But that's just one of the manifestations that I think a lot of people can connect to it because right now people are dying because of, because of, of this feature of how the, the, the vaccine has been rolled out. Because yeah. nobody has access in the third world right now, for example. And in, yeah, and in, and in the U.S., for you're, it's interesting because you talk about the, the access to land and plants and water. And right now in the U.S., not only are most people like don't don't really understand their technology that they're using every day. Yeah. I couldn't I couldn't fix I couldn't fix a toaster or make one. <laughs> yeah. But but we also most people live in cities and don't even know how to grow a potato. Right. So it's interesting because you live on a farm and you're sort of setting this up so that you call it the global village construction set. So I'm kind of curious, what's your vision? Do you see these sort of smaller scale communities having the technology to be a, you know, more self-sufficient in the context of that community? I envision a world of distributed, basically distributed economies mm-hmm. so that any city or village, like in history, uh, at the Dunbar scale, like 200 people and up and units of that, you can have a full, complete economy from that. But the missing link is where do you get the information? Where do you get smart people and train people to do the actual modern day civilization stuff? That needs to be open. And now it's not. So we're working on open sourcing all of that mm-hmm. uh, to make the world better and, and basically leapfrog through all the issues of poverty, wars, and, and other structural evils that exist and resource yeah. artificial scarcity that that is pervasive in our societies. Yeah. So yes, absolutely. Take take any technology, and any technology can be done on a smaller scale, or it can be done cleanly. Mm-hmm. It's what your motives are. So I I'd like to ask you real quick. You promote these fifty machines for this global village yeah. construction set, and the idea is that with these fifty, you can sort of make all the other things you need. Yeah. How did you come up with those? I'm just curious. <laughs> That's about right. So so you look at. Uh, so the product selection selection metric, you can read more about it on a wiki. I can send you the link. Yeah. But the idea is take all the current things that a human uses today. Like, okay, you got to get grow some food. Mm-hmm. You might need a tractor. Mm-hmm. And you might need need to move move around to work. You might need a car. You might need to produce the goods that you use. You need some fabrication capacity. So you just go through a list of, okay, this is what we do every day. Mm-hmm. trillion dollar enterprises and say okay let's open source each one of them one by one mm-hmm. if we have a kernel then 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 you can use that to rebuild any civil any um, community yeah. enterprise such as a farm or anything from scratch now let me just t- talk to you how that thinking has evolved we evolved way into the construction set approach so yes as you said you can build anything with the tools because a lot of the tools are productive tools such as here's how you get steel from scrap metal mm. virgin steel or other productive tools like precision machining to get yeah. engines out of that steel. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you can go from junkyard to to tractor on a yeah. small scale. And what's the scale that it takes? Oh, it's just a few thousand square foot workshop plus information. Mm-hmm. This this is talking about information age, digital age technology, automation, CNC, 3D printers. Uh, modern technology that allows you to do it very easily. In fact, a solution for, you talked about, uh, one might say, oh, you'll never get agriculture off the grid because you need a lot of lot of fuel to do that. Well, what about autonomous solar tractors that mm-hmm. do the same work autonomously, but with net present renewable energy from the sun? 
That's mm-hmm. completely feasible. That's one of the things we're working on. So oh, yeah, you add that. now automation to the to the old equations, and because we have so much solar power, there is no shortage. If you now start thinking a little differently and say, oh, "Okay, we can do it in a different way," uh, so for example, if you got to plow a whole field, if you want to do that, if you're not at permaculture yet, mm-hmm. do it with an autonomous tractor that's solar. It just unfolds its its wings of solar arrays like a like a satellite mm-hmm. in space and goes at half a mile per hour yeah, instead of care. 10 miles per right, hour. Right, right, right. So you go 50 times slower, but if you're autonomous, that doesn't, that's even, right. it doesn't hurt you. Right. It might take you a few days, but it'll still work. You've got a whole year to plow that field once. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of curious about this because some of the stuff you t- mentioned, like solar panels, I think about, you know, the factories that make those components, right? The, um, the photovoltaic cells, uh, semiconductor yeah. type components. And yeah. I, I sort of wondered myself, could we be making these things that will last hundreds of years, right? Because one of the things I worry about is a lot of renewable systems end up degrading. And I'm sort of curious about that. And, you know, like like, yes. like wind turbines, can you make wind to- turbines that you, with your equipment, could build but also easily repair and refurbish as opposed to the kind of the giant ones now that require helicopters and huge cranes and are made of... 20 different, you know, materials. Um, so, yeah, what, what's your thought about that? The answer is absolutely. But you have to design that. Mm-hmm. Now, who's going to design that? Not the industry today because yeah. of short-term profits. This is you talking about designing it so it's free. Design it so it's a 100-year lifetime. So, for example, on a tractor. On a tractor, we use modular power units as an example, just to give you an example. So, yeah. the, the engine goes out. Oh, that's how I, I got into this. My engine uh, transmission went out, paid 2000 bucks to get it repaired. It yeah. broke again a week after. And I said, no, I cannot do this if I want to talk about a sustainable farm and, and settlement. So we redesigned. We just said, okay, well, what's a tractor? It's a box with wheels, some hydraulic power. That's a very flexible source. Make the power units modular. So I've, I've gone through a couple of replacements where uh, the power, power unit goes out. Pick it up yeah. with a hoist. Put a new one in, bam, zero downtime. You're going again. How long is this tractor going to last? It's going to last 100 years. It's going to last as long as I decide. Mm -hmm. It's got modular wheel units, modular engine units. So it's a design principle of design for disassembly, modularity. Now you can do the same kind of thinking for your wind turbine. How do you do that? Make it maybe out of modular stackable sections that you can easily take up or something. Or go to maybe slightly smaller ones, but... Right. Not the huge, huge ones, but slightly smaller. And then you're going to say, oh, what about this high tech like a PV panel? Right. Well, I'd say 25 to 40 years. That's pretty good for now. Mm-hmm. But when you design it, make sure you're designing the recyclability infrastructures into that. Um, otherwise, you're talking about sand. You're talking mm-hmm. about sand uh, that's turned into silicon that's doped with minute amounts of stuff. Yeah, And that's your raw material. You've got plastic around it. You've got aluminum around that. Aluminum is highly recyclable. What is that? The, the sheet cover? Is that PVA or something? Yeah, I don't remember. The, it's a <laughs> thermoplastic uh-huh. that's also recyclable. Um, the panels, if they degrade, crush them up and uh, re, re-smelt them again into the ingot crystals. Mm -hmm. So think that way. You're very deliberate about where is it going to go after its useful life. And yes, absolutely. It's just a different way of thinking. And if you ever want to liberate society from having to work too much, it's just a prerequisite. A technologically uh, circular economies plus the ability to make things live as long as you like, the products Mm -hmm. that we use. And that's a huge value proposition and a clear a uh, case for the next economy that we're working on, this is inevitable. It's like at some point people are going to say, this is just too much. Why are we trashing everything after one hour lifetime of an object? Yeah, Ridiculous. It makes no sense. Yeah. And people just haven't caught up to that yet. We're not there yet, but it's inevitable. No, I think I think a lot of people are questioning the sense of the whole thing. And, you know, what am I spending my life force doing? And is my job, yeah. is my job uh, actually have any meaning at all? <laughs> you know? And I yeah. think, you know, so many people will be really excited about what you're doing. Like I come from biological background. So I threw myself when I started thinking about this, 
I threw myself into becoming a farmer and my mind went to like, geez, without fossil fuels, you know, okay, maybe there's some biofuels, but then I started thinking about the industrial design and, and manufacturing process and how globalized that is. And you can't, you can't fix your tractor nowadays legally, even if you buy it new. And I just said, well, maybe I should be doing horse farming or something. But I think for you, it's interesting that you come from this physics background and you decided to tackle these tool sets, these industrial tools. And I find mm-hmm. that amazing because I, I might, I myself am the kind of person I might blame industrialization for the mess we find ourselves in. And you seem to be in this sort of thing. No, it's, it's not necessarily industrialization per se. It's the scale it went to. It's sort of the ownership structures. It's the fact that people don't have control of the technology. Mm-hmm. And so you're, you seem to be trying to embrace the benefits of this, of modern technologies for manufacturing in the context of the right scale and ownership of it. Is that, is that a fair description of sort of where you've ended up? Tools are tools. You can use them for good or evil. Yeah. Uh, tools are powerful. Right now, we have more power than at any time in history to turn the, turn the tools around, and that's what we're doing. Uh, you talk about 50 machines that have pr- productivity machines and production machines as the core of the set. Talk about uh, demystifying that. Mm-hmm. That needs to happen. It's a prerequisite for a democratic society. Yeah. Newsflash, newsflash. We need to master our technology before we become free as humans or independent as humans. We cannot have democracy when small numbers of people and unjust governance structures control the way technology rolls out today. No, people have to do it. So the thing is, the the massive breakthrough on my side is it's like holy cow i can understand all of this actually like okay so i started building stuff and get, getting intense into that but then you start finding patterns hmm. it's like holy cow so now so there's 50 machines okay yeah. they can get you a lot of 80 percent of industrial economy um wait but what are these tools made of so now we have on a wiki we've got the 50 tools and 500 modules so what are the other modules that you need basic building blocks of everything. Mm -hmm. It will be things like, here's a hydraulic valve, here's a shaft, a ball bearing, Mm -hmm. a circuit. So you can go down to about 500 or so primitives that if you, to give you an example, anything you get on Amazon, like most of the consumer goods from your appliances to cordless drills to, to humidifiers, what are they? When you start looking at it, it's, we got plastic, we got an electric motor, we've got a microcontroller, we got some wires, maybe a little metal case. It's mm-hmm. like, okay, reconfigure those in different configurations, wires through which current runs, creates forces. There's only a, a limited amount of, of components that say this thousand or 10,000 products are made of. Yeah. Now, the good news today is you can take a 3D printer and print that plastic structure. You can take a CNC circuit mill and create the little microcontroller that's in there. That's fascinating. You can take metal metal processing infrastructure, milling or cutting to get whatever the the metal parts are for wires. That's that's called wire drawing. That's a metal processing technology. So there's only so many things you need. Yeah, that's the cool thing. There's like 500 things. If you master those, you know all of technology, and you can start talking about going to Mars. Interesting. It's fat because we we start off this show talking about this guy in um, Great Britain who I don't know. It's like 10 years ago tried to build a toaster from scratch. Are you familiar with that that yeah. story? Yes. And so yes. I'm wondering, like, if you took the toaster challenge, you think you could have done it? Of course. <laughs> Uh, So I was just talking, um, just to give you an example of how this works. Yeah. Let's go back to what I said before. Rocks, sunlight, plants, soil, water. Rocks. What are rocks? Well, it happens that my buddy in South Africa has got some ferrochrome. Hey, what is that? Hey, that's the stuff that stainless steel is made of. You put some of that into your iron pile and you got stainless steel. So there's an example. Mm -hmm. I got got you the stainless steel. I'll roll it with a metal roller. And create a thin sheet out of it, mm-hmm. and uh, I got my case for that that toaster. Mm-hmm. Uh, I take nickel, a common element. Mm-hmm. I take chromium, 
ferrochrome. That, hey, that already comes out of that ferrochrome I just mentioned. Mm -hmm. You can make nickel nichrome wire. That's your heater element and so forth. You can extract copper out of the, the ground. Hey, they've been doing that for thousands of years. Copper tools. There's a copper, whenever copper happened, what was that, like 10, 5, 10,000 years ago? Mm -hmm. um, steel came in, what, like a couple of thousand years ago? Uh, that they first start making steel things. It's all in the dirt. <laughs> yeah, or it's now you land, have uh, landfills or whatever now. Landfill. Yeah. It's in streams. You can put an electric cu current through a stream and take out little micro elements out of that, like mm -hmm. all, all kinds of. Man, it's all it's all there. It's uh, but but here's the deal. We are completely illiterate, enumerate, and scientific, scientifically yeah uh, illiterate. And I can say that myself because I left my PhD program and I was completely clueless. Yeah, we're very specialized. <laughs> You're hyper specialized, <laughs> and, and I now got you become a generalist. Whooped. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, and here's the here's the good deal. My my message for the world is that this is completely doable because, as I said, once you learn one thing, you'll see that the next thing you learn is going to take you half the time. Yeah, the next thing you learn is going to take you a quarter of the time, and before you know it, you're Michelangelo, <laughs> Renaissance man. Mm -hmm. But everything in society takes us away from that and i think this is like one of the greatest uh, evils in society like we are like john taylor gatos has a book called dumbing us down mm -hmm. <laughs> about the elementary school system yeah hey this is what society does unfortunately um you know we still have hope in high school that you know we can do some good things yeah by college time it's all getting into the proprietary world where now it's like all the proprietary guys start funding your education and stuff like that and you don't <laughs> learn the state of art stuff because you don't get that sorry in today's yeah. civilization. Uh, so there's a systematic way where we're just depressed as a civilization on a big scale. So we need to open up education and, and recreate education where people are learning more generalist skills and hands-on. And that's yeah. that's exactly what we're actually trying to do. So we're, we're actively teaching that. You can come for a three-month immersion program starting this September, or you can take a one year. We're starting actually oh. our one-year on-site immersion program learn to build a, a state-of-art center it's uh, the way we operate here is it's a it's an r d center yeah but create that it's like a campus like a campus with a farm with a micro factory with all the various elements of a village yeah so you've got this site in missouri it's a farm with 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 these shops and and buildings and you run you run courses and and so tell us a little bit how would people find out more about this where would they go We've been shut down from COVID, but yeah. we're we're starting back up and on September first through December. December first is going to be our three month immersion. So for this thing, we've been developing this thing called the Seed Eco Home. It's a, in order to make affordable, ecological housing widely accessible. It builds on the tools that we develop and just the open source techniques, uh, all kinds of things. But we're actually starting to teach people how to build homes. I need. That's a definite good market, and we're we're including the renewable energy, like the photovoltaics. In fact, seven kilowatts of that as a standard feature on all our homes, and we're yeah. Anyway, but but you can get trained to actually. It's like tech school, but more like visionary tech school with a definite growth track. You can yeah. take start with the three months to do learn how to build, mm -hmm. learn how to wield tools, and then get into okay. Let's start learning how to design, and then how to do enterprise around that so that's the that's a very explicit program where we're training builders now we call this event the september event it's called the summer of extreme design build so it's got several tracks one is the building the, the house builders but the other tracks are okay let's build tractors cnc mm. torch tables renewable energy systems and aquaponic greenhouses and more you name it learn how to build anything so if anyone wants to become unstoppable yeah and immortal in their productivity, <laughs> join us for a year or start with the three months. Also, we're in that same time, we're including short courses, which are 14 days for if you want to go through the whole process of how you build a house and all the modules. This house I live in is actually, it's modular. Mm -hmm. The panels are typically four by eight panels. So once again, like we talked about, how do you make that windmill last a lifetime? Build it modularly. Every part can be replaced. And that's how this house is designed and that's how the house that we're teaching about will be designed, is designed. But that's that's what you can learn. Okay. So if anyone wants to find this, you know, just search open source ecology 
and you'll, you'll get their website and there will be announcements on that. Yes. Yeah, so right now you can sign up for our email list, but as far as the, the actual announcements, so we're, we're getting close here. It's about a week we're publishing that. So okay. uh, very early April, we're going to publish the formal announcement for the three month, right. the short courses. And also for people who just have a weekend and want to get a taste of what this is like. Yeah. How would you feel about building a house over a weekend? We do that. This house was built in five days with 50 people. Yeah. We use swarm build techniques. So it's a highly collaborative uh, group-based build method based on open techniques and modular design. What does modular mean? It means that many parts can be made in parallel and then assembled rapidly into place. And that's how we can build our tractors hmm. in a single day. It's oh, crazy. Great. This stuff works. Technology works learn more about it. Well, thank you so much for your time. Fascinating to speak to someone who's got that the kind of optimism and skill set you do related to technology. So um, really interesting and gives gives people with that kind of interest and desire uh, a, an amazing outlet. So thank you so much yeah. for all your work. And I really appreciate having you here on Crazy Town. Thank you, Jason. Thanks for listening to this episode of Crazy Town. Yeah, if by some miracle you actually got something out of it, please take a minute and give us a positive rating or leave a review at your preferred podcast app. And thanks to all our listeners, supporters, and volunteers. And special thanks to our producer, Melody Travers. Hey guys, I wanted to introduce a new sponsor today. Yeah. It's a company that we have uh, just started working with. Their name is Terplexity. Mm. And yeah, I've uh, heard of them. They're fantastic. What they do is they, they help create sort of custom tourism experiences. And so uh, they reached out to us and we thought, you know, we're coming out of COVID oh, here. It's what a time. People have been waiting, you know, to, uh, to see the world again, you know, yeah. to travel around. And of course, our listeners, they, they feel guilty about traveling, burning those hydrocarbons. So they want to put it to good use if they're going yeah. to go it's on. Yeah, this has got to be meaningful, right? right. I mean, yeah, they, want be- a, they want a primary experience. Right. So what we oh. decided to do was to, you know, create a, a, a real experience that provides people with all the generalized knowledge that they need for the you know, for the modern world, right? Yeah. Ah. So, so here's the package. Okay. Ready? Yeah. 400 trips okay. around the world. Okay. It's only <laughs> going to take you, well, it depends on how fast you want to do this, it's six to 18 years. Okay. And you yourself, through this experience that they've created for you, will get to build your own toaster. Toaster oh. quest worldwide travel. Exactly. So, <laughs> ah. so all those 400 individual parts of the toaster that you talked about earlier, Jason. Okay. Our listeners get to go and and find each of those individual elements. The raw find materials. Find the raw materials. Yes. So they travel to the source. Right. They have to smelt, manufacture them somehow. Yeah, mine. Bring them back. Go to the next place. It's, it's I mean, like, like, an, like I said, it, it takes a little while. It's like an Indiana Jones adventure. This is I mean, brilliant. Yeah. This freaking... It's going to cost a... About $120,000. Can I use my miles? <laughs> if you have enough miles, yeah. Okay. That's not bad. That's not a bad deal at all for what you're going to get out of it. Because you're going to basically... You're going to get a toaster. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Thanks, Tor- <laughs> Thanks, Torplexity. Crazy town. Da, 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 da. Crazy town.